the text for today, the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, comes from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. And then it is this next section of the text which will form the primary basis for our meditation. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Have you ever had the experience of wishing someone hadn't said something? For example, you're having an otherwise pleasant social evening with friends, and somewhere in the course of conversation, someone says something that is so inappropriate, so terribly out of place, that it casts a pall over the rest of the evening. Or perhaps there is someone you admire. You admire them for what they represent, their moral stance, or their personal convictions. And then you hear or read about them saying something that you consider terribly out of character. Lutherans, for example, often have this problem with Dr. Martin Luther. It seems that toward the end of his life, the great Protestant reformer, perhaps out of sheer frustration, said and printed some decidedly prejudicial anti-Semitic things. So out of character, in fact, were some of these things that there are those who wonder if they are, in fact, authentic. Now, I have certainly found myself in the situation of saying something I wish I hadn't said. Sometimes I've done it without even being aware that what I said was offensive. You know, the funny thing is, although I take it back is certainly part of the common parlance, it is very difficult to erase words once they are heard by others. Print is perhaps even worse. At least words that we say have a chance to fade over time. But print, especially in the Internet age, has a way of resurfacing time and time again. Today's text is, I think, for many people, an example of why did he have to say that. Bad enough that Jesus states that he has come solely for the lost sheep of Israel, whatever that might mean. 
but then to add, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Somehow this seems almost cruel. Many is the preacher who wishes Jesus hadn't said that. After all, what are we to do with it? Anyway, we turn, we seem to run into theological and philosophical dilemmas. Did Jesus need to somehow come to the conclusion that he wasn't just there for the Jews? And if so, does that indicate that God can change his mind? Whatever happened to the same yesterday, today, and forever? Was it possible that Jesus was simply having a bad day and decided to take it out on this woman? And if that's the case, what about the sinless Son of God, a bruised reed he will not break? Certainly there are those who have suggested that this saying, for a whole vista of reasons, is in fact not a saying of the historical Jesus at all. But then, where do we draw the line with that kind of thinking? Do we expunge any and every saying that makes us feel uncomfortable, creating a kind of custom-fit Jesus? Is it possible Jesus was, as some suggest, saying this with a smile on his face, being ironic, since he knew he was going to heal this woman's child, he knew she wasn't a dog, and he knew that sort of cultural distinction is pure rubbish. I suppose that makes sense, in light of the woman's rather snappy comeback. Unfortunately, scripture, a lot like email or text messages, lacks a great deal in the way of inflection. There are no emoticons in the Bible, no smiley faces or winky faces, uh, to let the reader know that this is a tongue-in-cheek statement. I suppose, like every other student of scripture, I have my own theories on the nature of this particularly difficult text. But the truth is, I don't really know. Presumably better scholars than I have not necessarily been able to figure out this one in any really satisfactory way. So it's doubtful I can add much that is conclusive to this mystery of why Jesus said this seemingly uncharacteristic thing, if he said it at all. Instead, I'm going to apply a small measure of faith to this text and assume that the authors of Matthew's Gospel had their reasons for including this little vignette, and as such, I want to deal mostly with the aftermath, what we can learn from this text, strange as it may be. What we can't really get inside Jesus' head, so to speak, as he encounters the Canaanite woman, we can see what ensues. Specifically, what happens is what I will refer to as a triple scandal. Let me try to explain. The word scandal is from Greek, skandalon, or skandalos, and it really means a stumbling block that which causes us to stumble. And that makes sense. Scandal causes us to stumble. We hear about something scandalous and we emotionally or morally trip or stumble. That which we thought was good and right, someone we thought was good and right, somehow now seems to not be so good and not so right. Think of politicians caught in some untoward act, or again, the aforementioned thing that we wish someone hadn't have said. So the first scandal, the first thing that scandalizes, is the appearance of a Canaanite woman. She is calling after Jesus and his disciples. Jesus seems to ignore her. The disciples are getting annoyed. They beg Jesus, tell this woman to go away. The Jews hated Canaanites. It was a hatred that went back thousands of years and was very much alive and well in Jesus' day. One could argue that prejudicial hatred was unjust and misplaced. 
but it was nonetheless real. Perhaps the fact that any woman would make a spectacle of herself in public as this one had been doing was enough, but a filthy Canaanite no less? Now this was a scandal as far as the disciples, and presumably anyone else watching the scene, was concerned. So Jesus reacts accordingly when the woman addresses him, first stating the Jewish party line, so to speak. I was sent here for Israel's lost sheep, not for you and your kind. And then when she persists, he effectively calls her a dog. I'm not going to take food from children and cast it to a dog like you. The seeming cruelty of this statement is made worse when we consider that dogs in first-century Jewish culture were the lowest of the low. They were not pets. They were not to be petted. In fact, they were not to be touched at all, for they were unclean. They were not parts of households or companion animals. At best, they were considered an evil necessity, kept around entirely because they scared off animals that were even less desirable. And now it's our turn to be scandalized, the second in our trifecta of scandal. How could he say such a thing? All she wanted was help for her child. Now one can almost imagine the disciples nodding in agreement, hands folded across their chests, as Jesus puts this woman in her place. Of course, the woman is not dissuaded. We can safely assume she has probably, in her life, been called worse. Instead, she responds rather cleverly. Even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall off the table. She almost seems more confident than desperate. The image of Mary at Cana's wedding feast comes to mind. Woman, what has this to do with me, says Jesus. Yet Mary knows he's going to do something to fix things. And now comes the third scandal. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. One can almost imagine the disciples' countenances falling as Jesus says this. But, Jesus, didn't you just say she was a dog? Now you're going to heal her mud of a kid? Why? The immediate aftermath of the story is that, regardless of what Jesus said or thought, he did heal the woman's child. The disciples are left wondering, what is going on? or they are left with a new sense of what Jesus is about, or else they are just plain disgusted. Or most likely, all of the above. So what are we to take from this? At least two things, I think. The first, strictly speaking, if it is true that Jesus needed to extend himself against his initial will to reach those beyond the Jewish nation, then we are among those to whom he needed to extend himself. Unless we are pure-blood Jewish, then we too would have more than likely been considered dogs, not worthy of the good bread that was coming to the children of Israel. Yet along with that woman, we may also in confidence say, yes, I may be a dog, but I can still get some crumbs. And what crumbs God provides? Healing, new and abundant life, acceptance into his kingdom. And then there's the second thing. Right now, you may be saying, hey, I'm no dog. And if you recognize that you are a person made in the image of God, part of the body of Christ, in fact, then you are correct. But then if that is the case, if we are really members of Christ's body, bringers of light, gatherers of the lost sheep, then we too will need to move past scandal, past being scandalized by the clearly expressed needs of our fellow human beings. 
Once again, I'm not really going to say whether I think Jesus actually thought so little of this woman and then changed his mind, or if in fact he said what he said for his disciples' benefits, or ours for that matter. But what is abundantly clear is that he transcended the scandal of responding to someone who by all rights, by all the beliefs and customs of the day, was not worthy of assistance. It's true she may have been the enemy from time immemorial. She may have been a filthy dog by Jewish standards. But Jesus nonetheless granted her the mercy she desired. Now for us, the body of Christ, we live in a world that increasingly wants us to believe that some people or people groups are dogs, those of other religions, those of other nationalities or political persuasions, enemies and dogs who would just as soon hurt or even kill us. Why should I help the Mexican or the Palestinian? Why should I be kind to the Democrat or the Republican, the Protestant or the Catholic, the gay or the lesbian or the straight? We might ask all that and more as we stand scandalized with the disciples. And the world tells us we have a right. Look what they are doing to us. And Jesus would have us transcend the scandal of otherliness. Jesus would remind us that we are all children of one God, each made in his image, each destined for communion with him in his eternal kingdom.